said, if something is nonsense, something is contemptibly stupid, then I'm going to say so. On the other hand, if there's a serious argument, an argument that raises pointed questions, then I will treat it as serious and investigate it in a serious manner. Called identity politics, woke politics. It's just such a nonsense. It's so devoid of any intellectual content. Illustration. Obama found no place for Cornell West. He found no place for Cornell West. He found the place for a low life, sleaze bag, poverty pin, Al Sharpton, and Dean. What's Candy's program? His program is you need more black people in the 1%. That's all. You know, what does disparities mean? There are too few uh, black people in the 1%. Get me in the 1%, and then everything will be fair because they'll be in the 99%, they'll be equally distributed between, proportionally distributed between black and white workers. Later, 100 years later, China is the cutting edge of world capitalism. What bridges the first half of the 20th century from the first half of the 20th century? There's a very simple answer. It's three letters long. You know what it is? Mao. Mao left. Since its genesis, there has always been a recognition that certain groups of people experience forms of oppression that are not easily reducible to class oppression. No, Kimberly, you didn't discover inter intersectionality institutional me mechanisms are so restrictive that literally in India you have no right to abortion. I mean, on paper you do, but the, so, I mean, why is it, why is it necessary to say that life is important for, when that's the norm? That seems to be the norm for me. I, you, I think you're missing a point. You know, people who never got past fourth grade biology, but they know all about sex. They know all about genetics. I walk out of class feeling a little guilty. Maybe, maybe it made that case a little bit too persuasive. You know? Um, so yes, I, uh, money was never my thing in life. I never particularly cared for it. I grew up in the 60s and I liked the ethos of the 60s. I just think that the left has become completely corrupt. Hello and welcome. Today we have the very special Norman Finkelstein with us. Norman is an American political scientist, activist, former professor and author. He is one of the leading, if not the leading scholars of Israel-Palestine conflict and Holocaust studies. On his 2018 magnum opus, Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, Professor Noam Chomsky commented in its comprehensive sweep deep probing and acute critical analysis, Finkelstein's study stands alone. John Dugard, a distinguished authority on international law who was also the UN Special Rapporteur in occupied Palestinian territory, described Norman as the most serious scholar on the conflict in Middle East. Raul Hilberg, the leading scholar on Holocaust studies, said that Norman's place in the whole history of writing history is assured and posterity will judge Norman, Norman's work more fairly than ever. Thank you so much, Norman, for coming and also sharing the manuscript of your upcoming book. Well, thank you so much for having me. I just have to warn you in advance, it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit right now in New York, and I don't use air conditioning or fans. I like to live the way Gandhi lived. And so, um, if I start sweating or I seem breathless, that's because the heat is very oppressive. Um, but as I said, if Gandhi managed, I'll manage. Great. It's, it's very hot here as well. Uh, right now, I'm in New Delhi. It's very hot and I also don't have an air conditioner. 
Do <laughs> you have a fan? Yes, I do have a fan, yeah. Okay, so you're already one technological epoch ahead of me. Ah, okay. All right. All right, then let's uh, get into your upcoming book, Burn Bridge on Cancel Culture, uh, Oak Left and Academic Freedom. Uh, the book is enormously important in presenting a radical or left critique of the oak left and the nuanced analysis of academic freedom and political correctness. It's a bold intervention to create the space needed to critique the politics of identity-based oak left. It presents a passionate and convincing defense of placing class at the center of our political thinking and actions. It raises serious questions of privileging truth in academic space over anything else. And it exhorts the readers to handle complex social political problems with care rather than using easy politically correct categories and, explain, uh, and explanations as answers. I really enjoyed reading the book. By the time I ended reading the short acknowledgement section, uh, I was terribly sad because the, the, the autobiographical account touched the raw nerve and I sort of wanted more. Uh, so let's just start on this personal note. Uh, I mean, uh, as I read your book, I remember the scholars of peasant insurgencies across the world have noticed that during peasant insurgencies, one of the things that rebel peasants would do is to abuse the landlords. An explanation is that peasants try to uh, return what is done to them at an everyday level. Some scholars have called it inversion. Given the so highly- scholars have called it what? What was the word you used? Uh, Ranajit Guha has called this inversion. Uh -huh. so as if they are trying to invert the structures, the everyday structures in, in moments of insurgency. Now, mm -hmm. given the highly polemical style of the book, at least on the sections of on identity politics of gender, sexuality, and race, one wonders why you chose such a polemical style. Is it a conscious choice of giving back the champions of oak politics on its own terms, or is it just your style? No, I don't. I don't actually believe the book has a polemical style. Um, I did say very carefully in the forward to the book, I said, if something is nonsense, something is contemptibly stupid, then I'm going to say so. On the other hand, if there's a serious argument, an argument that raises pointed questions, then I will treat it as serious and investigate it in a serious manner. Um, so if you look, for example, the last two chapters of the book on academic freedom, uh, basically it comes down to what a professor should and should not do in a classroom and what a professor should and should not do outside the classroom. That's the essence. Uh, I treated that with a, a great deal of seriousness. I, I was a professor most of my life. I think the questions are serious. And they need serious reflection. And um, of course, there was a certain passion in forming it because of my own sincere commitment to truth. And also because, as I say again in the forward, chapter eight, the last chapter, was a reflection on, did I deserve to be canceled? So I looked at it closely. Well, was the claim that I lacked civility a legitimate grounds for effectively barring me from academia and from any kind of work for the last 15 years of my life? That was serious. But when you look at this so-called identity politics, woke politics, it's just such a nonsense. It's so devoid of any intellectual content. And it has to be said, the exponents of this quote unquote politics, they are promoted, they are promoted because they're stupid. They're, no, it's true. They are promoted because they're stupid. First of all, people who otherwise would be 
you know, raking in a very minimum salary in academia, are suddenly drowning in money. That's not a small thing. You know, Robin DiAngelo, uh, her, uh, her total intellectual gray matter, it could fit into a thimble with a lot of room left over. And she must have made like $15 million from the book. And secondly, when somebody is stupid, it's much easier to manipulate them. When you're smart, uh, you can hold your own. But when you're not, you don't know if you're coming or going. And so it's very easy to manipulate them. And so the high priests and high priestesses of cancel culture, identity politics, they're, they're stupid. They're just you know, flat out stupid. And uh, this is not to say, listen, there are quite a large number now of first-rate African-American scholars doing African-American history. There are quite a lot. I read some of their books. I read David, uh, David Levering Lewis's uh, two-volume biography of W.E.B. Du Bois. That's a work of art. That is a work of art. I had to reach for my dictionary two or three times each page. That was a series of literature and biography. Um, so it's not like there is a dearth of serious scholars to treat these topics. So why did they take Ibram X. Kendi? Why? He has a PhD in African American studies from Temple University he studied under this guy named Olefi Asante, who's this African mystic. Why did he get promoted? You have to ask that question. There are gifted, talented, able people who have real insights. I learned a lot from Adolf Reed. I learned a lot. Most of it is unacknowledged in the book in the sense that it's not, I, I learned from listening to him and I drew ideas from him. Uh, he's a smart guy. His last university where he taught was University of Pennsylvania, one of the Ivy League schools in our country. Why didn't he get promoted to first rank or primus unter pares, first among equals? Why was it? Why wasn't it him? Why was it Ibram X. Kendi? It's the same thing, incidentally, with the Barack Obama uh, administration. It was for me a very noticeable fact that a very a very impressive African American intellectual, very impressive. I don't like what he did with his life, but there's no question in my mind. Cornell West is smart. His range is very impressive, but not only that, his depth is impressive. I don't know, I don't know anything about 99 of 100 topics he talks about, but I do know about one or two that he talks about. And you know what? On the one or two that he talks about, he gets the details right. He gets the details right. He's a smart guy. It's very noticeable. We have this character here. He's a poverty pimp, a low down, a real sleazebag uh, named Al Sharpton. You wouldn't know him. They call him the Reverend Al. He's just a complete crook. He had an important position in the Obama administration. Obama found no place for Cornell West. He found no place for Cornell West. He found the place for a low-life, sleazebag, poverty pin, Al Sharpton. He found no place in his administration for Cornell West. Why? Because, first of all, Obama doesn't like smart black people around him. It makes him feel uncomfortable because he knows they can see right through him that he's just a windbag. <clears throat> Um, but secondly, because if you're smart, 
You're not so easily manipulated. You answer back. You know, he doesn't, they don't want people to answer back. The ruling elite in general, and people like um, Obama in particular, they don't want people who can answer back. At least people who are going to rock the boat. Obviously, he surrounded himself uh, Obama. Obama's idea was, all you have to do is uh, surround yourself with Harvard geniuses, mostly white and mostly Jewish. Surround yourself with white Jewish Harvard geniuses. And then all he had to do was give the speeches. He was exactly, he was a replica of Ronald Reagan. Reagan didn't do any work. They used to say his workday was about five hours. He just sat at the desk and ate jelly beans. No, that's not really true. That's what they said. And I think it's, it's certainly plausible. But uh, Reagan, you have to read a, a teleprompter. He was an actor. And actually, as Gore Vidal said, the social commentator, Gore Vidal, uh, who, who was a, he, he had his insights. He said, um, don't underestimate Ronald Reagan as an actor. He was a very good actor. And uh, he acted through two terms of office. And of course, he did nothing. He had no idea what he was talking about. But he surrounded himself. And Obama thought the same thing. Surround yourself with white Jewish geniuses, and all he had to do was give the speeches. And of course, because he was black, so all the um, you know the woke liberals trying to show how woke they are. We use the expression virtue signaling. So you signal your virtue by saying, "Oh, Obama's so brilliant. Obama's a genius." No, Obama was. A mediocrity. There's no hint. There's no. Um, there's no um, clue that he had an idea in his head. Uh, he was doing basically what Reagan did, just reading from the teleprompter and then delegating all the authority to white Jewish, uh, white Jewish geniuses, uh, and. Um, so, uh, to, get, to return to your question, I don't feel I was being polemical. I was being, I was being um, scathing. That's true. I was saying the emperor is naked. However, is there an argument I missed? Is there an argument I evaded? Did I choose the weakest cases, as it, you know, the straw men, as it's called, versus the strongest cases? I don't think that's true. Even with Kendi, uh, I went through every argument. I went through it systematically over 50 pages. That was a lot of uh, parsing. Every argument and asking a simple question, is there anything there? Now, sometimes it was on the most superficial level, there was something there. There was. But it was also a commonplace. So let's take a typical commonplace. A commonplace is if you're a member of a minority, if you're a member of a minority group, anything you do, good or bad, reflects on the whole group. That's just the name of the game. Whereas if you're a white person, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, now about the U.S., if you're a white person, you're a member of the majority, whatever you do or don't do just reflects on you. That's an imbalance. If a, you know, if, if Will Smith uh, goes up in the Oscars and gives, um, his name just slipped my mind. Chris Rock. Yeah, and, and punches Chris Rock. What does everyone think? Black people. You know, whatever he does, he reflects on black people. Whereas if Charlton Heston went up and slugged Chris Rock, you just say Charlton Heston. You know, you're really, oh, Charlton Heston, and you're really hard. Okay, so um, Ibrahim X. Kendi says black people, they have to, whatever anyone does, Everybody else bears the responsibility. 
you know, everyone in your group is uh, held accountable for whatever action of black, which is true, uh, action of black. Does he add anything to that argument? I mean, that's just a complex. Everybody knows that. Does he add anything to it? Is there a novel insight? Is there a new angle? No, it's just a commonplace. So if I treat him with contempt, it's because what he's produced is contemptible. He writes a whole history of African American. There have been many histories written of African American, you know, long, over long, long overviews. Why would she choose his? There's nothing in it. All he does is page after page after page says, he's a racist, she was a racist, he was a racist, she was a racist, he was a racist, referring incidentally to black people. Every black person is a racist except Angela Davis and Malcolm X. Everybody else was a racist. Including Du Bois and Robson. And Boy, everybody's racist. Frederick Douglass was a racist, Du Bois was a racist. Everybody was a racist. That's history. That's history. All right. Yeah, yeah, please. yeah fair enough. I mean, um, I'd return to some of uh, the things that you touched uh, about the power relations within a, a university or um, how much money uh, uh, some of the left superstars, I think that's the word you used in one of your footnotes. Uh, and you mentioned a, a small anecdote yeah. when you, you were traveling. Well, to it, about, it was, you, know, uh, you know, it still had, it still is vivid in my mind. I went to speak in Kerala. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, but, but just to wrap up uh, this section, uh, I, I mean, in all fairness, the polemical part of the book that I was, ref I mean, that, that I referred to was limited to, uh, let's say, the discussion on Crenshaw, uh, D'Angelo. No, and... don't, don't, don't defend yourself. That's been the reaction by many people. Yeah. That's why I said in the forward, because some people said you should signal that you're going to be very vicious in this book and explain why. So your reaction is everybody's reaction, but I don't, I don't agree, uh, and I'm just disagreeing with you. I'm not attacking you or assailing you for your uh, observation. Everybody said that. I don't agree with it because I did what other people don't do. Even critics of people like Robin D'Angelo, even critics. Mm -hmm. I sat down and tried to make sense of the argument. It wasn't just name calling. I'm saying, here is the argument. Does the argument make any sense? Let's look, go through it step by step. So yes, I was no holds barred with that airhead. Yes, it's true. But is it true that I don't have an argument there? Is it true that it's just name calling? Is it true that it's just a tantrum? No, that's not accurate. Right. I went through all the arguments step by step. I am incapable, constitutionally, I'm incapable of not making an argument. I mean, that's my style. I take a text, I analyze it. A lot of people say you analyze it to death. Yes, it's true, I can be tedious. But there's an argument. I look at exactly what she's saying and then try to make sense of it. And same thing with Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and then and um, Abraham X. Kendi. And then at the end, I say, well, if there's no argument here, then what accounts for this person's um, prominence? And then I tried to give what I think is an explanation of why this person was promoted as against somebody else. What, what's the reason for this? So it's basically, uh, as I learned from Professor Chomsky, he said, if you, there's an argument you disagree with, first of all, before you speculate on the motives of the person, who wrote, who made this argument, before you speculate on the motives, the first step has to be to show why the argument is wrong. Mm -hmm. 
So the first step is you have to parse the argument. If you've made a compelling argument that the text is worthless, there's nothing there, then you can move to the second step, which is to speculate on motive. So in each of the chapters, it's organized around, first demonstrate this argument is hollow, it's spurious, it's specious, it's vacuous. And then at the end, I speculate. Why was Ta-Nehisi Coates being promoted? Hey, maybe because he was being used and allowed himself to be used to derail the Bernie Sanders candidacy by constantly bringing up um, reparations. Why was Robin DiAngelo being promoted? I said, well, what's her main shtick? That black people can never trust white people. That lurking at every white person is a diehard racist who thinks you're an ape. That's literally what she writes. Who thinks you're an ape. Don't trust white people. So, at a moment where there seems to be a potential for white and black working class unity, the first time since the 1930s, incidentally, there's a possibility, exactly at this moment, Robin DiAngelo emerges to tell black people, don't trust them. I know them, I'm white, don't trust them, okay? Kimberly Crenshaw, well, Kimberly Crenshaw says, corporations are much more enlightened than Bernie Sanders. That's a useful thing to say, don't you think? If you're in the ruling elite, that's a useful thing to say. And Ibram X. Kendi, what's Kendi's program? His program is, you need more black people in the 1%. That's all. You know, what does disparities mean? There are too few uh, black people in the 1%. Get me in the 1% and then everything will be fair because they'll be in the 99%, they'll be equally distributed between, proportionally distributed between black and white workers. But right now he said the problem is that 1%, it's too white. And guess what? The ruling elite thinks that's just fine. So we have to, you know, throw Ibram X. Kennedy $10 million to open up an anti-racist center uh, at Boston College. They don't produce anything, no, literally. I'm, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. They don't produce anything. They don't produce any studies. If you go look and Google his name, it, it's interesting. He assembled a harem. It's like he assembled 30 nubile uh, people of all colors. He assembled a harem. So they figure, okay, and then promote him as the expert. And, you know, democracy now eats it up because they're, Amy Goodman is so thrilled when she sees a black guy with dreads. You know, oh, now I'm really with, down with the hood. Now I'm with the radicals, you know? And it's all uh, a game. So that's what I think is going on. But you can't say that at the beginning. At the beginning, as I say in the forward, these people may be frauds, but it's not so easy to explain why they're frauds. That can be complicated. And that's what I do. I go through it step by step by step. Um, I remember when I was, um, when I came out of my Maoist phase, I was a Maoist. Uh, I make no apologies for it. I made some errors. I'm not convinced it was entirely an error. Uh, I don't want to digress, but when I, in, in, in the Western world, in the first half of the 20th century, China was known as the sick man of Asia. And the images of China were two. One was mass chronic famine. And two, was the indignity of the Chinese coolie pulling the rickshaw for the British official. 
That was China. Those are the two images. They are vividly etched in my mind. I do not exaggerate a jot. Of course, there was, you know, the mysterious Orient and, you know, that whole sort of thing. But the two images were the back spine broken Chinese pulling the uh, rickshaw and the um, uh, famine. 100 years later, 100 years later, China is the cutting edge of world capitalism. What bridges the first half of the 20th century from the first half of the 20th century? There's a very simple answer. It's three letters long. You know what it is? Mao. Mao. I have the best biography of Mao sitting on my uh, desk. It wasn't apologetic, very critical of Mao, but recognizes the things he did. It's called Mao, the man who made China. That's what it's called the man who made China. Before Mao, there was no China. It was just a notion. It was divided up among warlords and of uh, the foreign powers. There was no China. He literally, in the most literal sense of the word, he made China. What he did was stupendous on a world historic scale. Horrors occurred, yes, I will not deny it. Gross errors made, I won't deny it. Crimes committed, I won't uh, deny it. Mao was ruthless. He went through a 30-year civil war in which all of the members of his family were killed. And he became pretty let's call it inured to death and suffering. No question in my mind about that. I can't deny it. You know, I, I have to face facts. Nonetheless, saying all that, acknowledging all that, it's still breathtakingly stupendous what he achieved. You know, it's there's really nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Down to the finest details, you know, he had worked out during the Civil War in Yan'an province. He had worked out, a, I, I don't want to call it a philosophy, a, a kind of uh, blueprint. It's not There's the right a people's word. report, I guess, in, uh, that came out of his work in Jiangsu uh, commune. Uh, it's a very famous uh, report by Mao. It's called something and that's like... I always I a, a, a report on a peasant, a pe, a peasant rebellion in Hunan province. I always called it because my favorite line is in that report. It's the line is um, no investigation, no right investigation, to speak. yeah, investigation, no investigation, yeah, no investigation, no right to speak. Which is to say, if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, then shut the fuck up, okay? Which I think if if they've abided by that principle on the web, 99% of the activity on the web would disappear. <laughs> no investigation, no right to speak. Um, so, but one of the things I took away from that experience was that you can't dismiss everything you disagree with back then we would call it all bourgeois this or petty bourgeois that. Anything you disagree with is bourgeois or petty bourgeois. Uh, my friend, um, Roy Friedman, his father, I mean, I was a raving Maoist. Um, his father, I said, oh, you only, he said to me, you know, Norman, by the time you get to China, there's going to be a McDonald's at the Great Wall. He was actually right. I said to him, oh, you just say that because you're a petty bourgeois. And he said to me, no, I'm, why do you always call me a petty bourgeois? Why can't I be a full bourgeois? <laughs> <laughs> Is it because they didn't have uh, a lot of wealth or own means of production? <laughs> it was a double put down. You were not just a bourgeois, you were a petty bourgeois. And um, so one of the things I walked away from that experience with is 
be careful before you're too dismissive of your critics. And when the uh, my small claim to fame from ancient times is when this book came out claiming that the Palestinians didn't exist, that uh, Palestine had been empty, the Jews came, made the desert bloom, and then all these Arabs from neighboring countries came in and uh, turned it and, and, and pretended to be indigenous. They came for the jobs to Palestine and then pretended to be indigenous, okay? And when the book came out, it was a big national bestseller and all the leading intellectuals, uh, Jewish intellectuals, praised it to high heaven. And then those in my camp, the left camp, Everyone was calling it, oh, it's just Zionist propaganda, Zionist propaganda. And I thought to myself, well, I heard that before. We called it bourgeois propaganda. But it turned out a lot of the bourgeois propaganda about China, not all, but a lot was accurate. And I just dismissed it as bourgeois propaganda. And I thought, said to myself, you know, once bitten, twice shy. I'm not going through that humiliation again of being shown to be all wrong. And so whereas everybody else dismissed it as bourgeois propaganda, I sat down and went at that book. It had 1,853 footnotes. I checked every one. I went at it like Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. I was monomaniacal. And it turned out the book was a fraud. I'm generally credited with exposing the fraud. Um, and that's been my modus operandi till this day. You have to prove. You have to prove in a rational, convincing way that this is, if you believe it to be nonsense, that it is nonsense. And I think I do that in the book. I leave no argument unturned. I go through every argument. I don't choose straw men. Nobody's going to say, I know now, nowadays it's going to say straw men, straw women, straw LGBT, blah, 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 whatever. Um, I go through every argument. And um, so I don't think the book is a rant. I don't think it's a tantrum. I don't think it's devoid of argument. I think that's a flat out lie. And I'm going to say it out loud. Right. I'm going uh, to say it out loud. You're not going to intimidate me. Uh, Tarek Ali, you know, famed revolutionary Tarek right. Ali, he, you know, he decides he's going to put me in, his pl in my place, the, the ideological arbiters of the left. And they were going to come out with their big sticks and put me in my place. I got news for you. Truth puts me in my place. Nothing else. If I'm wrong, show me I'm wrong. But don't think you're going to intimidate me. It's not going to happen. Tarek owns half of Pakistan. I have a little apartment which I pay rent on. So you think because you're so rich and so important, you're going to stop me. No, you're not. What will stop me is show me where I'm lying. Show me, show me where I'm misrepresenting. But you think you're going to put me in my place? It ain't going to happen. Okay, no. Take that idea out of your head. You're wasting your time. That's not my. That's not how I operate. I I, I enjoyed your uh, response to Verso uh, of that. Uh, uh, you know, through that song, I'll survive. But uh, yeah. that apart, uh, I mean, uh, let's uh, let's push the conversation on identity politics a little further. I mean, your uh, book did a, a remarkable job in showing uh, the problems with uh, this oak identity based politics in how how incapable it is in dealing with the problems of uh, class, uh, the issues of uh representation based politics uh the problem that we, that you call as infinite regression that how deep do you go i mean it's just one caste then you know further caste and you know sexualities and so on so forth uh, that, that footnote was done by an indian you know ah okay and then, then also uh your point that uh, even for cases of racial disparities, you would have to look 
at the reasons, the causes in a more serious ways. And sometimes it might be because of market relations that racial disparities or caste disparities are being generated, not that everyone is being racist. Uh, right. you know, the way it is. That's why, that's why the uh, Indians are overrepresented in ownership of Indian restaurants. Right, right. You so, know, it, there's a disproportionate number of Indians who own Indian restaurants that specialize in Indian cuisine. Correct. Does that prove their does that prove racism? Correct. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> that that's, that's that's very convincing. Uh, uh, but. Uh, that said, uh, uh, my point uh, and my question would be, um, just clarify uh, whether you think that uh, there can be ways of using progressive identity politics uh, that doesn't uh, go into the infinite regression along with a broad class-based politics that seeks for a more sort of uh, a redistribution of wealth and privileges and so on. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you take a look at the scholarships on uh, affirmative actions in India, uh, Piketty has written this in his new book, but many, many scholars before that, uh, it has been shown how the reservations for the SCs and SCs in particular. Now, of course, uh, as you discuss it in the US context, we see the problems with the OBC reservations and more and more groups, and there are very conservative groups like dominant groups like the Maratha seeking for reservation and so on and so forth. But when we talk about the SCs, uh, the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe, these are very specific cases where affirmative uh, actions have been shown to be beneficial. Similarly, for instance, uh, your case on reparation is very apt that how Crenshaw uses this uh, reparation card to sort of launch her attack on the Bernie campaign. But that on the other hand, yeah, quotes, yeah. But on, on, on the other hand, uh, I mean, if for instance, Piketty's discussion on the case of Haiti, you know, uh, so this is a very specific discussion where he makes a very strong argument that why uh, the reparation for the case of Haiti, or even for that matter, the African Americans, and which doesn't mean, let's say, uh, doing away with all the wrongs that happened with the African Americans, but let's say the tackling of the problems of housing. So he uh, referred to, if I'm not wrong, he referred to some of these, one of these experiments in Chicago uh, itself, where there was uh, a discussion on some 120,000 or something as reparation, which can act uh, as a means to affordable housing. So my question is, because surely you would agree that your critique of the oak left is not the critique of, let's say, um, Jordan Peterson or Peter Bogosian, right? It's, it's, a, it's a more radical critique of the oak left. And that's the more refresh, I mean, remarkably refreshing part of your book. Then where do you draw the line uh, on identity politics? Because otherwise, we cannot, I mean, in my opinion, we cannot simply say that the identity politics of the right, uh, you know, the, the, the Hindutva politics in India, the white supremacists in the US, blah, blah, uh, the, you know, Confucian politics in China, uh, is not one and the same as uh, the identity politics on the left. Now, there, this has been pushed to an insanity by some people. But there can be more progressive ways of using identity politics along with a broad coalition of class politics. Your response to this? Uh, first of all, reasonable question. Uh, secondly, I'm not reinventing the wheel in the book. Since there was a left, since its genesis, there has always been a recognition that certain groups of people experience forms of oppression that are not easily reducible to class oppression. That's why you had in the left vernacular, the left vernacular, we refer to the woman question. We refer to the Negro question. We refer to the Jewish question. What did these questions mean? It meant they add a wrinkle to the class analysis. 
there's another element there. And truth be told, very difficult to theorize and very difficult in practice to figure out how do you deal with that special element. And you could say, in many instances, it wasn't successfully addressed. I'm happy to agree with that. A lot of people say there was a lot of racism in the Communist Party. They'll say there was a lot of sexism in the Communist Party, whereas others will say that, in fact, the Communists were in the forefront of the African-American struggle in this country. That's why the two most revered figures in 20th century, Du Bois and Robeson, ended up very close, if not in the Communist Party. Uh, so you could say, yeah, there were difficulties. I'm just saying, that's not a new question. This is not something that Kimberly Crenshaw or identity politics invented. Everybody understood that, say, the woman question. I mean, where did International Women's Day come from? It came from Russia. It came from Russia after the revolution. They declared March 8th or March 8th. The second uh, international day. Yeah, International Women's Even Day. Even before the Russian Revolution. Yeah, well, I think, but they made it an official holiday. Uh, yeah, I they think, did. Uh, the revolution yeah. happened during the Women's Day on November 8th, uh -huh. 2017. But it's March 8th, the International Women's Day. March. Okay, yeah. 8th or 9th, I can't remember. I think it's March 8th. Yeah. yeah. Um, so these are not new things, and I'm perfectly willing to... I'm, I can yeah, sorry, the February Revolution, March 8th, yeah. Sorry, that's, 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 that's yeah, the I'm first revolution. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge these are complicated questions, but this pretense like, oh, the whole left was wrong until we came along and we discovered intersectionality. No, Kimberly, you didn't discover inter intersectionality. That was discovered about 100 years ago. Um, number two, how do you address it as a practical matter? Um, There are different aspects of affirmative action. So you have one aspect, which is, <clears throat> let's say you have a factory or a union that's in an area where there's this vast disproportion between the number of black people in the area and the number of black people who occupy the better positions in the union or in the in the this in the factory. It used to be factory, now there are no factories, but you know, in the factory. And therefore, certain um, um, mandates were set up within two years, your union or your uh, business has to reflect the distribution of people in the community. Nobody ever objected to that on the left. Everybody understood the reason why the senior positions in the particular factory, say an auto factory, the better paying positions, that they were all white. Uh, whereas, say in Detroit, which is where the um, auto uh, industry was located, whereas in the community, the community is overwhelmingly black where the best positions in the auto industry are held by whites. Everyone understood that was racism and it was perfectly legitimate to mandate you better get black people in those very paying positions. I was looking at a much narrower question, namely <clears throat> the value of um, affirmative action in universities and colleges. And there I felt that uh, serious issues arose. Um, I go through them one by one in the book uh, by analyzing the main affirmative action case in our country called Baki, the Baki case. I go through it carefully and I come out with a, a mixed verdict on that particular affirmative action. Um, I happen to believe 
that the Bernie Sanders approach, it needed to be tweaked, it needed to be worked out, but his basic approach was a major redistribution of wealth that benefits everyone. However, it will benefit in particular those at the bottom of the totem pole or at the bottom of the ladder. So we will have a major public works program. However, we will emphasize public works in the inner city communities. So it's basically his strategy was um, to build a movement that would benefit everyone. However, it would benefit those at the bottom a little more than everybody else. That strategy, in my opinion, had a chance of winning people over to it. You know, white people, yeah, they don't like what they consider to be handouts and they don't like uh, being pushed to the back of the queue. However, if you talk to a white person, most people are reasonable. Yes, uh, black people were shafted in our history. No question about that. And uh, there is still the problem of racism, you know, George Floyd, it's there. Uh, so if you say they're gonna get a little more because their communities are so, you know, run down, the schools are so bad that they'll get extra. I think you could have got one over the white working class to that idea. Um, so I thought his strategy was, Right. The problem was that the Democratic Party then mobilized its identity politics not to work with him, not to work with him, but to destroy him. They wanted him to say things like, I support black reparations, knowing he'll lose the white working class on that. They knew that. That's why they did it. If they wanted to work with him to try to tweak his program, uh, I'm sure he would have been open to that. It was the same thing with defund the police. He said, if you mean by defund the police that we're gonna close down every police department in the country, then I don't agree. So what happens? They all say, oh, he's against defund the police. You know, he's a racist. It was complete, pure, distilled, bad faith. It was distilled back, uh, bad faith. Angela Davis could support Kamala Harris, a ruling elite hack, but she had problems with Bernie. She had problems with Bernie. So that to me is the issue. If you say that there are instances in which affirmative action has been proven to work. Of course, I agree with that. Of course, I agree with that. I, I lived long enough to see uh, all the all the um, plum, plum positions occupied by white people in the city services and everything. And of course, uh, there had to be a mandate enforced by the courts. This has got to end. I have no problem with that. Um, and I don't think Bernie Sanders did. You, you could see the way I quoted at length from his program to show how he tried to find a right, a, a, a good resolution between the special oppressions of black people and keeping that working class coalition together. The identity politics people had one goal, break that coalition, break it, because that's what the Democratic Party needed to stop Bernie. Bernie could probably have won over 25% of Trump supporters. Remember, a significant, they estimate about 10% of the whites who voted for Obama then voted for Trump. Right. So, and I think it was probably higher. So they had to stop it. That was that was their purpose. 
whether they were they witting agents, not to use conspiratorial language, but I'll use it. Were they witting agents of the ruling elites? Yeah, half and half. Yeah. Some of them are too stupid to even know. I mean, Robin D'Angelo doesn't even know what she's doing. He's a total airhead. Uh, but other ones, I think Tana Hisi Coast knew what was going on. I think he knew what was going on. He was disgusting. He was disgusting. And I'll say it out loud. Well, I'm not supposed to say it because he's black. Oh, he has a hip name, Tana Hisi Coast. I don't care if your name is XXXXX. If you're full of shit, I'll say it. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, I have uh, three more questions. So let's. Uh, so the next question, I would just like to uh, like us to be a little uh, quick, uh, so that we can we can discuss the last two questions more uh, elaborately, and perhaps because this you have uh, taken up this question uh, on a different platform, but still. Uh, because I found that this is the weakest uh, and least convincing to me uh, among uh, everything that you discussed in the book, which I at least would seek a little more clarity, is uh, your position on uh, abortion. Um, uh, and I, I mean, some of the things you wrote finally that eugenics, for instance, was considered very progressive at one point in time in history and later found out to be so problematic uh, uh, or just a hoax and so on. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, you had a very lengthy discussion on the legal history of how the courts considered whether does life begin and not and so on and so forth. But uh, I had two problems with, with, with the discussion. A, I found uh, the approach uh, uh, slightly conservative, and by conservative, what I mean is uh, how conservatives uh, respond to uh, radical possibilities during revolution. For instance, oh, don't go too far; there will be violence, excess. Let it be incremental, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's what I felt having read that section. And uh, the second problem that I found is that you didn't discuss the real problems, and I would say overwhelming problems with that come with the denial of abortions. I mean, uh, and we all know it. I mean, uh, all of us who are unmarried and, uh, you know, you know uh, the fear, you know, you, you have sex and check your condom twice, filling water, whether it leaked or not. And that's the fear. And that's much more living in a conservative society. Uh, many, many women, there's a very, uh, uh, almost an evocative and very seminal piece uh, students of history on Saudi Asia would know. It's called Chandra's Death, um, which discusses a case of abortion uh, in 1850 India, where she had to choose between uh, aborting the fetus or being outcast, because such was these were the two choices left to her. So right to abortion is really, really important. And the section didn't convince me. Would you, uh, uh, and I, I might have mistaken it. So would you, would you elaborate? First of all, never be defensive. If you read it and you read it carefully and you don't agree, just say, I don't agree. You don't have to say, you know, maybe I misunderstood it. You strike me as a perfectly intelligent young man. I don't use complicated language. You could have read it and you could have disagreed. Okay, so let, let's start from there. Uh, having said that, a lot of your listeners might be, or our listeners, might be wondering, I thought the book was about cancel culture and identity politics, so where did abortion come in? Why is he talking about abortion? So first of all, it's important to set out the context for my remarks on that topic, okay? What was the context? The context was this. I was going through the possible... Uh, arguments for why you have the right to suppress speech. And some people say you have the right to su suppress speech because what the person is saying is obviously wrong. You know, like Holocaust deniers. It's obviously wrong, so you have the right to suppress the speech. Other people say you have the right to su suppress the speech because of the evil motives of the person who is articulating an idea. So, because that person is evil, ergo, you have the right to 
suppress what that person is trying to say. And then I looked at another case. I said one argument that's made is our ideas are enlightened, their ideas are backward, and therefore we have the right to suppress the speech because it's backward, it's regressive, it's primitive. Uh, whereas I was a forward-looking, enlightened, secular, uh, as against religious. Um, so I looked at that example, that instance. And then I looked at a particular case. I began by saying we have to be careful about being so certain history is in our sight. I then quoted the famous author Lincoln Steffens, who goes to Russia in 1919. He comes back and he says a line that I cited in my youth, I have seen the future and it works. Well, guess what? It didn't work. History's verdict was not what the most progressive people at the time thought. And then I made the point that just as Russia was the future internationally for the left, uh, Eugenics was the domestic future, the application of science to population, the application of science to improve the quality of the material of the human race. And eugenics was all the rage. The most progressive states in our union passed legislation supporting eugenics. The leading lights of our Western civilization, be it a Winston Churchill or a Bertrand Russell or an H.G. Wells, they all supported eugenics and they all frowned upon, looked down their noses at all these religious people who opposed eugenics on the grounds that all of God's life is sacred. We shouldn't be in the business of deciding who should live and who should lie, die, and which groups are desirable from a eugenical point of view, and which groups are not desirable from a eugenical point of view. And I said, guess what? The history's verdict after that eugenics experiment climaxed in a paroxysm in Nazi Germany, history's verdict is those stupid, backward, primitive religious people who insisted on the sanctity of all human life were right. And the radical leftist secularists were wrong. And then I posed the question, can we be so certain that the verdict on abortion in, say, a hundred years, if humanity survives, which is very doubtful, I mean, we have to be honest about that, but if humanity survives, um, that the verdict on abortion won't be the same as the verdict on eugenics. And when we nowadays read Plato's Republic and he just talks about disposing of defective children, and when we read it and we recoil in horror at this long list of kids who have congenital diseases, who he says should be quietly disposed of, the equivalent of throwing them in the incinerator. Yeah. You know. I said, we recoil in horror at that. Uh, can we be so certain that in the future generations, assuming there is a future, that they won't recoil in the equal horror at our practice of abortion? Can we be so certain about that? And then I proceed to look at what I take to be the strongest arguments. So, for example, I look at length at the Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion. I want to look at their argument. Does the argument hold up? Is it internally coherent? 
My answer is no, for a very simple reason. You cannot render verdict, you cannot render a verdict on abortion and its legitimacy unless you have some notion of where life begins. It always comes back to that. You could talk about the suffering, the horror, the pain, the anguish of a woman having to bear a fetus to live birth. You can talk about that till the end of time. However, it does not negate, nullify that fundamental question of whether the fetus is alive. Now, you may talk about a thousand horrors, and I'm going to agree with you. But there is a countervailing factor. The fetus might be a life. In which case, it's very difficult to justify the abortion. I said, I recognize circumstances in which I call it an extremist, extremist, you know, extreme, extreme circumstances in which it's hard to dispute. I also said, I think the woman should have the last word. I take a radical left position. I say from conception to birth, the woman should have the last word. I can't see giving that power over to the state. However, I also say there should be a severe social stigma attached to it. In the same way as you and I and everybody else has a right to self-defense. If somebody attacks us with a weapon, it's a life-threatening situation. We have the right to take that person's life. However, that is an extreme, extreme situation. The general societal precept is thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill. But that, 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 that is the case, right? Isn't it? What is the case? That's the, that's the norm that, uh, that life is sacrosanct. I mean, why are you calling right. for that? Uh, right. And I'm saying that same principle should be applied to abortion because the fetus might be a life. We don't know that. And I said the problem I have is this notion that if you even raise that question, you're some sort of religious primitive. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with you on that. That you have to be backwards. No, you don't have to be backward. I had a delightful, very bright student in my class, a woman, Kayla Hernandez. And she was extremely smart. She, she was probably a practicing Catholic, never discussed it, but she said, I don't believe in abortion. And I said to the class, does she look to you like a misogynist? Do you think she hates women? Does, does, does Kayla strike you as that type? Do you think she wants to deny women sexual pleasure? Do you think, is that what Kayla's motive? Or maybe she just really believes the fetus is a life, you know? I don't see why you have to demonize everyone and just call them stupid and primitive. If no, they I, I agree with you on that. So that's all I said in that section. I summarized. If you think I inaccurately summarized it, then tell me. No, I, I totally agree I chose, with I chose the Supreme Court decision because it was the most thought out defense of abortion. So I wanted to see the tough case. The Supreme Court voted seven to two to overturn the legislation prohibiting abortion it was a landmark decision. And obviously there was a lot of pressure to justify this landmark decision. So I went through the reasoning. Is it convincing? No. Yes, yeah, no, I, 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 no. I totally agree with you, uh, you know, about the um, uselessness of this uh, oak attitude of uh, dismissing or, or labeling someone as, uh, you know, regressive Catholic or so-and-so. I mean, I, I, on that, I have no argument with you on the point that we still don't have a consensus about where life begins, uh, the stages of embryonic cells, and then they go get into fetus and stuff. I mean, I agree with you on that. My problem, however, is that 
uh, your discussion uh, doesn't take into account the reality that one, the overwhelming consensus, progressive, regressive, conservative, collective overwhelming consensus is that life is sacrosanct and nobody calls for abortion just like I, that. I don't think that's correct. I've read, I've read, I've read a lot of the. I'll just conclude. I'll just conclude and uh, have you uh, have your response. You're and right. B, I mean, uh, after the whole, um, uh, you know, the, the events unfolding in the U.S., your articles um, in the Indian newspapers covering Indian laws on abortion. And we fairly know how restrictive they are. I mean, legally, you know, you have the right to abortion on so and so months and so on. But the institutional me mechanisms are so restrictive that literally in India, you have no right to abortion. I mean, on paper you do, but the, so, I mean, why is it, why is it necessary to say that life is important when that's the norm? That seems to be the norm for me. You, I think you're missing a point. I'm, my book is about cancel culture and woke politics. I'm, I'm talking about the people on the woke left who dismiss anyone who disagrees with I them. agree with you on that. Being backward and primitive. I agree with you on and, that. And, and it's very, very interesting. I took the, the, the strongest case by a woman named Katha Pollitt. She's an extremely smart woman and a really uh, impressive writer. So I opened it up. I think it's called PRO, P-R-O, as in pro-abortion, okay? And I, because uh, she wanted to make the point that the reason she says she's she's not pro-choice, she's pro-abortion. So she's the smartest person out there so far as I can tell. I opened up her book. What do I read in her book? She says that choosing abortion is an easy choice. Easy choice. She says that it's win-win. Everyone benefits from it. Society benefits from it. The woman benefits from it. And it's a no-brainer, of course. Well, there is an issue there of the fetus. Easy choice. And if you don't believe it's an easy choice, she says, you must be brainwashed. You must be brainwashed by misogynist men who want to deny you sexual pleasure. Well, I've met a lot of very intelligent women who anguish over the decision. And I don't think it's because <clears throat> they've been brainwashed by misogynist men. I think they're anguished because, hey, guess what? At six to seven weeks, they hear a heartbeat. And they get very excited at that heartbeat. It's their child. It's not an alarm clock. You're not hearing an alarm clock tick. That's why they get excited. Most people, including women, don't get excited when they hear an alarm clock tick. But when they hear the equivalent of a harm, alarm clock in their womb, they get excited. You know why? Because they think it's a life. And then taking that life is an anguishing decision. Do they have the right to make that decision? I said yes. I couldn't figure out how to say no. I said yes. But does society have the right to attach a stigma to it? Yes, it does. Because you don't know. It's not an easy choice. It's not a win-win. There's also a, a potential very big lose. That's all I said. You don't know how many people attacked me for that. Because, you know, my generation, abortion was the litmus test of whether you were a liberal or conservative. And so people were so appalled that I raised these questions. You know? It's a very interesting fact. Young people don't react like that at all to it. You know, maybe in India it's different. Young people, because they didn't go they didn't go through the battle over abortion. I know the noise is bothering you. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Totally fine. Young, young people didn't uh, go through the battle over abortion, but they're very laid back about discussing it. I mean, I teach the Supreme Court decision on abortion. People, you know, there's disagreement. There's heated disagreement. But there's a recognition that disagreement is legitimate. There's a recognition that the disagreement is legitimate. Upon the Mulk left, no. 
I mean, the love club, it's not even legitimate to say there's a male and female sex. That's sexist. Transphobic. You can't say there's a male and female sex. So, not sure. You know, people who never got past fourth grade biology, but they know all about sex. They know all about genetics. Pretty idiotic. Fine, fair enough. I mean, I, I already was in total agreement with you on, um, I mean, uh, you pushing have back to agree. against you the don't openness. Have to agree with me. No, I mean, I, I just. I, I want to just I, get clarity on how this whole thing came up in the book. Like, I'm writing a book about cancer culture. How did the abortion come? It came up because I don't like the self righteousness of these identity politics people. They think anyone who disagrees with them has to be canceled because they have to be this, that, or the other. No, you could just disagree. No, I mean, I was in agreement with, I mean, insofar as uh, saying uh, that the oak way of handling with anyone who says that life is important, uh, I mean, I am in total agreement with you on that. On, on our difference was that the call for stigma, at least in the society that I live in, already is enormous and the point that any woman who chooses to go for an abortion maybe not in the case uh, with the you know person that you are uh, referring to but for overwhelming women who choose to opt for abortion uh, it's a difficult choice for given right i think it should be a, a difficult choice that's my whole problem my problem is i say in that passage is there's a danger of trivializing life when you don't think it's a difficult choice. Yeah, but that's that seems to be a tiny minority about whom you are. And that yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it, it could be a tiny minority of the population at large, but my book isn't about the population got at it, large. Got it, it's got about it. Oak Cliff. Oak Cliff, yeah, got it, got it. Um just uh do you have the time to hold back for ten more minutes? I would just quickly wrap up two more questions if mm -hmm. if you have the time. Um So, uh, I mean, towards the end, your the defense of free speech is uh, truly inspiring and convincing. I mean, you have written how you dealt in the classroom about uh, uh, Jabon's, uh, Jabotinsky's yeah, defense of moral case about the Zionist, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, position. I try to give the best case to the Zionists, and I really get into the role. No, I mean that that was very that was that, that was very uh and then I walk out of class feeling a little guilty. Maybe maybe it made that case a little bit too persuasive. <laughs> yeah, no, it was very persuasive and the whole chapter was very, very convincing, you know, that uh in the academic space if we want it to be generative, we'd have to be welcoming about different positions, different questions, and out of those interactions and disagreements would be a, bear the more generative aspects of act. And yet, you know, the following chapter, you, you write that when from uh, when your tenureship was denied from Deepal, you were charged of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, ad hominem attacks. Yes. Uh, well, not in classroom, not in classroom. You know, even the poll acknowledged. In the classroom, right. excellent teacher. So is the external influence, your disagreement with uh, Professor... Um, uh, Dershowitz, Ben yes. Morris, yeah, a whole bunch of So people. that led, so just would you tell us a little little about that, that, that whole, and also just tell us about how American universities' power relation works, uh, the, the power of the provost, the dean, how much power the uh, teachers' collective control and uh influence of the of those who donate and so so and so forth just give us a sketch of the power relations within the american universities well first of all in answer to the first part of your question from a young man i had a clear sense of what i wanted to do with my life i like to read. I like the life of the mind. But I didn't want to become a dry intellectual. First of all, it's not who I was. 
And secondly, I felt it was a betrayal of my parents' martyrdom during World War II. That I can't reduce human suffering to a laboratory experiment. Uh, it's life. My parents' lives were destroyed. My mother, one day, she has the best life in Warsaw. She went to the best schools. She was president of her class, president of her grade, went to Warsaw University, was studying mathematics, loved her father to death. And then the next day, everything's gone. Can you treat that in a kind of clinical way, what happened? I, I didn't believe you could. And I don't, I don't did it and don't believe you should. When I discovered the Marxist tradition, I gravitated to a certain kind of Marxist. The, one, the type, the type that joined together the most rigorous standards of scholarship. And remember, the socialist movement at the turn of the 20th century, it represented the peak of human civilization. The leaders were so cultured, art, music, you know, uh, all the, the, the peaks of civilization, they had internalized, and that was considered normal. Everybody read literature. Everyone went to concerts. So they represented the highest attainments of Western civilization joined together with a passionate, passionate commitment to revolution and justice for oppressed peoples. And I took that as my model. At a relatively young age, I read Marx's Capital. I subsequently read it many times. I read volume one three times, volumes two and three twice each. Read it very methodically, copied it out paragraph by paragraph in the notebook, and then put comments at the side. And if you read Marx's Capital, it's the most highbrow literary references he has in there, Goethe, um, Schiller, you know, he has this very high, combined with the most lowbrow insults. I mean, he viscerally, viscerally, he hated these people, these apologists for this bloodthirsty system, you know? And that was what I attempted to combine, not at that level, obviously, but try to combine in how I wrote. Um, and so I say in the book, if being uncivil means it should deny you tenure, then logically, Karl Marx shall to teach in the university. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? I don't think it's, it's crazy. So I didn't, on that basis, I didn't believe there were legitimate grounds for denying me tenure. Because I wasn't civil, half the faculty at half of these top universities are war criminals, but that's okay. You're allowed to be part of the machinery of death in a senior position. You're allowed to be part of the machinery of death, but if I insult Alan Dershowitz, that should disqualify me. I, that doesn't make sense to me. Believe me, I gave that serious thought. I went through every argument, every argument, you know, tried to make sense of this. And the conclusion I reached was um, the, uh, the same one as uh, Raoul Hilberg, the founder of Holocaust Studies. He said, Finkelstein's style is not my style. That's what he said. But then he said, at the end of the day, what counts is whether what's saying, what he's saying is true. And he said, they went through all of the documents he went through. And then he said, you know what he said? 
He said, my findings were conservative. That's what he said. I have it right here. I would say now, in ret this is at the back of the Holocaust industry book. I would say now, in retrospect, that he was actually conservative, moderate, and that his conclusions are trustworthy. It's true. I never deviate a jot from what I'm absolutely certain I could defend in public. Because I know everybody's going to come after me, so I better be able to defend that sentence. So I better be able to defend that claim. You know, I'm very conservative. I am very conservative. Because when I'm writing, I have watching over me the 10,000 people who are going to pull out the daggers. But when I feel confident about a conclusion, yes, I'm going to say exactly what Marx said, exactly what Lenin said, you know, that was, those were my models. And also, later in life, Chomsky, you know, um, so um, I didn't think those were legitimate grounds. If you, uh, if you think there's something wrong with my argument, fine, show me what was wrong with it. Where, where did I go wrong? You think Karl Marx, who even Schumpeter ranked as one of the greatest, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, a conservative economist, he ranked Marx as one of the greatest economists of all time. You think he shouldn't have been able, allowed to teach in a university? Does, does that make any sense? Not really. Not really. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, lab superstars taking uh, $20,000 and a round trip uh, for a single talk and how you managed to do it in maybe $500 or uh, uh, even zero. zero. How, how, how have you managed to... Because one of the things that, uh, that, that is so inspiring about the more autobiographical account uh, of the book is how you have managed to stay away from uh, money, uh, let, let's say. And that these are the examples. I want to be absolutely honest about that. I have no reason to be dishonest. The first fact is I didn't have a family. Had I children, the whole thing would have been different. I have to acknowledge that. I was only responsible to myself. If I had kids and I had to feed them and clothe them, send them to good schools and things like that, it would have been a wholly, a wholly different thing. I have to acknowledge it. I have to admit it. You know? Um, so, yes, I, uh, money was never my thing in life. I never particularly cared for it. I grew up in the 60s, and I liked the ethos of the 60s. I mean, there were aspects of it which were completely self-absorbed, and there were aspects of it were completely hedonistic. But there was a, an ethic of simplicity. Women, they wore what were called peasant dresses, dresses they made on their own. When we went off to college, we packed one pair of work shoes, two pairs of jeans, and two uh, work shirts, put it in our backpack, and that's what we brought to college. That was it. Now, obviously, those people eventually became very rich, and the 60s is just this nostalgia of youth. For me, it stayed with me. It stayed with me. I like that ethic. You know, I'm probably the only person in the United States or the world. I have no air conditioning, no fan, no cell phone, no iPhone. Only recently got a credit card because my laundry room stopped taking cash. Um, and I, I couldn't care less. I, I really, how could you live without a cell phone? Easy. I, I don't need it. I don't care for it. it doesn't, it's, I, I just don't need those things, you know? So, um, but having said that, I just think that the left has become completely corrupt. So the example you gave, I um, went to Kerala, a very nice Muslim group. You probably know the group because uh, they're Mapilla. 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 The guy's name was Shaheen. Very yeah. nice guy, you know. And then I went there, and my standard speaking fee is do the best you can, keeping in mind I'm unemployed and unemployable. And I I don't remember what they gave me. Maybe nothing. I I have no idea. I didn't really think about it. And uh, when they they said. 
So you know the do you know Naomi Klein? I said, Yeah, of course I know Naomi Klein by name. I only met her once. And they went like this, come over here, come over here. Biaka Shari, son, Shari, son. And they brought up this email from her saying that to come to India, she charges twenty-five thousand dollars plus a first class round trip ticket. You know, they literally they couldn't believe it. I mean, the most literal sense. <laughs> they just couldn't comprehend that. How could a person calling himself a leftist send an email like that? For Christ's sake, this is India. Um, that's just typical of the complete corruption, the moral corruption of the left. And I'm, I'm going to call it out. Right. Yesterday only I read a, a news about a professor at UC Berkeley, a uh, distinguished uh, scholar on uh, anti-caste, Ambedkarite scholars, uh, let's name him uh, Dick Nicholas. Uh, he takes a salary of $570,000 a year as a chairman. Uh, and that's over and above many of the cases that he has used public fund to build his own private mansion. So absolute corrupt, corruption. I, 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 watch, I watch what he'll charge for a speaking fee. He'll charge 15000 to speak for an hour. It's pitiful. All right. You have also you said, you quoted Marx that uh, I would not allow the... Yeah. Uh, I, uh, believe me, unlike a lot of other people, I took to heart what I said. I knew I would never change. There was something in me. Uh, you know, a lot of it was respect for the for my parents' suffering. Not always. Uh, that always <clears throat> served as a uh, warning. Uh, so I knew I would never change, and I took these things to heart when Marx said. Uh, come hail or high water, I will not let the bourgeoisie turn me into a money-making machine. Right. I know that I, I carried that with me. I carried a lot of this stuff with me. I carried a lot. I made a lot of mistakes in my in my life. I made a lot of mistakes. But the, uh, I have no problem. The basic values of my youth, I kept them. Right, Captain. I'm very happy to say I never grew up. Very on happy. that, on that inspiring note, uh, um, thank you so much for coming, and you've been very generous with your time. Uh, and this was a really, really uh, important discussion. And wish you all the best for your uh, coming book. When is it uh, coming out? Uh, hopefully around November.